Can me? I can, yes. Uh, might have a slight delay, do we? I Not from my end, I don't believe. Okay, okay, good. Great. So, welcome, Mr. Bond, dare I say. And um, yeah. I'm very happy to have you to talk about your book, which I'm sadly, I must say, I have not read. <laughs> because I don't have time for reading books right now. But I've seen you interviewed about it, and I think I got the gist of it. And there's many interesting things I'd like to quiz you on about it, if that's all right. So yeah, maybe, sure. start, maybe start by uh, just introduce yourself and your book and what it's about, if that's OK. OK, yeah. My name's Chris. Um, I'm the author of a book um, by the name of Nemesis, which is uh, kind of an extension of the work of a, a man named uh, Bertrand de Juvenel. He was a French political theorist, um, philosopher, I guess, in a sense. And he was pretty active in the post-war years. I, I don't recall when he died, but he was a contemporary of um, um, Mises and um, von Hayek, and he was operating in that sort of liberal circle. He was also active with the Mount Perlin Society. And um, the specific piece of work which he produced which has been very influential and which was uh, central to the book which i've written is his work called on power which he wrote in the aftermath of the second world war and he was basically trying to explain the development of totalitarian governments at that time uh, as i say it's kind of in a similar vein to hayek's thought um, for example with um, road to serve them it was actually released at the same time they actually promoted the books together but it's a very different book to his and it's very it's much better it's much more significant um than hayek's work in my opinion okay and what is the what's the main theme of the book oh well, the main theme of the book yeah as i said it, it goes it follows on from um juvenile's work in, in juvenile's work what, what was central to his work was he was trying to as i said trying to think trying to explain how totalitarian governments came to be and okay. he followed the development of centralized power back through the ages back through a long time and one of the influences on his work was another french writer by name of uh i believe i'm not sure if i pronounce his name right i never i can never be sure i think it's Fausto de colanges maybe my, my accent on that is completely wrong don't ask me but i'm, I'm yeah. canadian but I, I didn't study french for some stupid reason there was a lot of russian immigrants where i grew up i studied russian which i've never used my entire life completely useless and i meet, I meet yeah, people I, mean, I meet other people from canada and they start speaking french i'm like sorry i'm I'm a failure in that regard, so sorry, carry yeah, on. I mean, yeah, so yeah, it, it, he, he, he wrote a book called The Ancient City, which is very much in the same light as um, Juvenile's book. What, what he did was, as I said, he went back through the past and looked at the way in which power came into being, centralized, centralized power. So, for example, when we think of centralized power and totalitarianism, we think mm -hmm. of um, you know, the Hitlers, the Stalins, the Mussolinis, and so on. But he, he went back in the past, and one of the things which normal people and even political theorists actually presume is that kings in the past had a great deal of power, and this power was gradually reduced and gradually taken away from them until we get to the period of democracy. And then with democracy and later governments, power is diffuse for our society, and there's no central power, even though... When we get to the Second World War, we have some orders where it's very obvious there's an exceptional hyper-centralized power in mm -hmm. the examples of Russia and examples of Germany during the Second World War. But then the Western world, England and America, kind of have this sort of, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I have to say it, but it's kind of like a, a, a false belief that their orders are not centralized when in reality they are hyper-centralized. Hyper so Juvenile kind of turns down his head and he kind of makes the point that previously kings did not have much power. And over the centuries, centralized power has increased and increased and increased all the way through. So that the point when we lose kings and we end up with democracy and parliamentary government, that's not actually a decrease in centralization. That's actually a massive increase of centralization of social orders. Um, so that's what the book basically did. And I've tried to expand upon Juvenile's thought and tried to pick apart parts of his thinking, which 
don't really match his central finding that power has been more and more centralized over the ages because he was a liberal and liberals have specific sort of political and pre philosophical beliefs which they carry with them which this um system of juvenile's political theory just does not match so that's basically what my book was an attempt to do to try and extract the central model away from juvenile's political liberalism and try and build something completely new yeah well that is fascinating and so before i quiz you on what you've added to his theory i just like to understand his a bit more so according to what he says then kings of the past did not have as much power as people think so you say in the case of stalin or mussolini etc that they then were sort of themselves not as powerful as they seemed and sort of just a figurehead or a totem for a larger power behind them is that part of it what you're saying or no well no it's, a, it's one of those things where it's very hard to explain because this is very alien to modern thought but right. in older orders there was no there's nothing like we consider sovereignty so you would have a king but he didn't actually have that much power he would be for example he basically just be like one um like one amongst the nobles right so you would have many nobles for example like um the best way to 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 show it is to go back to prior to the medieval period after the fall of rome you had the germanate kingdom set up in western europe yeah. now for these kings these kings would basically be the heads of armies they'd settle an area like the franks or the goths they'd conquer a territory and then they would disperse the land to their um subordinates what well, if, if kind of subordinates they always considered themselves as like equals so the king was like the head of the equals okay and he and it was not considered that the king could make law he could only discover law okay. which is one of those things which is really really hard to wrap your head around because <laughs> it's something we see in um yeah, so it's like in societies. Like, oh, sorry, pardon. I'm sorry, sorry, go on. I'm, okay. Yeah, he, 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 he could only well, he could only approve laws which he discovered, or which were discovered. We, can you so explain that better, though? Can you explain? Yes. Yeah, so whenever, if you go back into the um, a read in, in into the decisions and the way they framed the decisions, it's always yeah. acting within ancient law, which was already preset before them. Okay. And when we get to the modern period, this starts to become really farcical because they always, for example, we end up uh, during the English Revolution and shortly afterwards, you have a, a big movement where people keep talking about trying to reestablish the ancient law before the Norman invasion, as if they were trying to rediscover Anglo-Saxon law, which existed before the Norman invasion. And the Norman invasion then became something which was like, uh, an imposition onto the English territories, but that that's that's how it would. The kings would only act within laws which were already in existence. They could not make their own laws. The idea of making your own laws comes with sovereignty. So that's okay. why people like Bodin and Machiavelli they start talking about the prince being able to make law and deciding what to do. But before that, everybody considered law as being something to be discovered and not to be made. Right. And right. say it's, it's, it's something which modern people have a lot of trouble grasping. It took me a long time to grasp it as well. Well, so you're thinking, so it's more like you can have the king, he's so sovereign in a certain way, say even in Machiavelli or that Florentine period or any of the epochs of the great, I always think of like Vlad the Impaler or something, the amount of, or even uh, Constantine, you know, they showed a lot of initiative, personal initiative to kill their enemies and to appear to have a kind of very personally centralized power uh amongst their nobles or other people they would just kill their enemies kind of thing but you're thinking more this is just like the administrative power the law power behind what oh. is, is is a separate thing kind of is that is, is that sort of what you mean the thing is they they couldn't they, their ability to make new things and to do new things was exceptionally limited they were acting within a role which was already set for them right. so if they were the king they had specific roles and specific things they had to do as the king they couldn't then turn up the next day and decide let's change the law i don't want to have to do this we should do this instead right and right. a lot of the time like you see a lot of time in uh, the, the, before they make decisions they'd 
go to a priest or for you see this with the greeks a lot I mean, every time i read greek history or roman history i'm always amazed by certain things like i remember reading about the sicilian expedition of the athenians during the peloponnesian war yeah and they're on a harbor and they're ready to escape from sicily after the campaign has been a disaster but they right. don't go because one of the priests has done a, a sacrifice yeah yeah and he's decided that there's a the, the moon is wrong so they can't go uh, i love it so then they wait it. the next night they do it again yeah. moon is yeah. wrong can't go they keep doing that until they, eventually they get surrounded and they can't leave and they all end up getting imprisoned and right. that's something which carried through to all societies before they make any big decisions they'd go to the priests and they would to consider the sacrificial what sacrifices were telling them or the auspices the romans were yeah. very keen on doing this as well so mm. again it's not there's always a case of trying to present the decision as being either say like law discovered or the decision coming from a, a, a something external to the order it's like a god was giving them the indication or right. gods were telling them what to do right okay so that's a bit so you're admitting there's that hidden religious spiritual element not admitting i shouldn't say that but you're that's what you're sort of insane or at least that's the way they interpret it see for myself when i think of this part of the reason why i'm interested in juvenile and what you're saying is i see power i notice power in the world as sort of a current of i feel like it's something as juvenile did and as you're doing you can notice a pattern of like it's behaves almost like an animal like he, both currents of human power are about that power in nature it follows like a like a, a network of influence and it sort of follows its own rules that may be counter counter intuitive but if you observe them and maybe kind of like notice them even say how you're saying about um centralization is the real power behind behind kings and leaders like it, it's these noticing these things that are and thinking of power as a, as an entity of its own this is sort of how i think about it in some ways so maybe the greeks would have seen it the same way so you have that trying to tap into a a force that you can't quite understand through intuition and the the hero specs or whatever well, the it's, Greeks are a really interesting example because they foreshadow what's happened in the modern period and with the Western world from the 15th century onwards. Because right. the Greek order was just like that. If the king was basically kind of like a high priest. He's kind of half like a high priest. So part yeah. warrior, part high priest. Again, he couldn't make any decisions by himself. He couldn't suddenly decide to completely change the order and say, we're going to change the law. We're going to do this differently. He'd yeah. have to, again, go to the sacrifice and see what the gods were trying to tell them. And right. what happened is the Greeks developed money. And once they developed money, the central, the king was able to transcend this system and to actually separate himself from this system and to gain, he stopped being the king and became dictators. So that's when the first dictator came onto the scene, when right. money became widespread and the dictator could use money as a, a means to organize society outside of this sort of sacral um, connection. Right. So then the Greek words for things like dictator and uh, the like um, become words which are very much unsacral. They're not they're not related to any sort of religious the words are brand new right. so that's something which has happened with us as well um in front of the, the, the when we get machiavelli and from the boding as well when we start to get sovereignty it's because the kings have stopped being part of sort of a sacral order and they've started to be able to organize society around money um right. which is completely different organizational means but right. what's really interesting about money is money comes straight from the temple system and is itself a form of um Safety. sacrality is, is, is yeah. entwined with it right yeah yeah so uh, so you're saying they in that converting to money power has created this increase of central centralization and in your opinion then is the centralization force itself a kind of headless machine of like just ra cultural power that is runs rampant like willy-nilly like letting loose rats in a, in a maze and seeing where they end up or is it like does it have its own does it have its own intention say beyond it's just gaining more power for itself or for the culture at large of which it sort of is secretly in control does that make sense well 
uh, again, uh, if you go back to the Greek example, as I said, the first um, dictators, uh, they started organizing around money. So that, mm -hmm. then they could reorganize society based upon money relations. Because prior to that, their connection with the rest of society would have been along the, the sacral order. They would have, um, and it would have been a direct connection between them and the heads of families who themselves would have been had their own little sacral order because each family had its own hearth for fire which was yeah. its own little sacral center so yeah. you've got loads of these sacral centers around the major sacral center which is the king yeah or the dictator which comes along after which completely routes around all of this and just starts yeah. using money now one of the things juvenile um, was struggling with when he was writing his book and trying to explain what's going on with this central power grasping this power, these dictators or the kings grasping this power, is to explain what they were doing. Because in liberal theory, when we when power is talked about, it's always talked about in an extremely negative sense. Like if somebody's trying to gain the central power or try to increase their power, they're being they're acting like tyrants. They're selfish. And tyrant, again, is a Greek word, which is completely desacralized. Yeah. But when you look at it in more detail, these, these so-called tyrants and uh, the kings who are trying to gain more power, they're not doing it for their own personal selfish means, which is something which um, another thinker, English thinker, Robert Fulmer, made a good point about when he wrote his uh, book, um, Patriarcha, that they're actually doing it to try and benefit the entire society at the same time. So right. that, as Juvenile points out, you've got this dual duality to power. On the one right. hand, those in power want to gain more power because they just want more power. It's something to desire, yeah. something to want. But on the other hand, there's a social aspect to it. They want that because they want to do good or to benefit the society in order. Right. I mean, you can see this very clearly in, let's say, the more modern period, when we get to, for example, the revolutions in France, Russia, China. Mm -hmm. Those revolu revolutions happened because the central powers were trying to centralize more effectively. Um, in the case of France, it was the uh, King, King Louis, obviously. In Russia, it was the Tsar. And in mm -hmm. uh, China, it was the Emperor. And each one of them was doing it because of geopolitical necessity. So right. the French were in massive conflict with well, pretty much everyone at that point, especially England. <laughs> Russia was in the middle of the war, First World War and was, uh, yeah. And then China was being carved up by all of the foreign powers. So these different orders tried to centralize. They weren't doing it because they wanted power so much, as much as it was they needed to do it to compete with other central powers. So this, it, this, this liberal idea that power increases for its own benefit or because it's selfish and greedy and needs the power, that's only partially correct. There's also a, a social aspect and a geopolitical necessity to it, which so causes uh, more problems. So you're saying, so centralization then is definitely controlled and managed. Um, absolutely, you would say. Yes and no. They, For example, with the revolutions, that's a really good example because the Tsar, the, 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 the Emperor and King Louis, they all tried to centralize. They tried to centralize in as effective a way as they could, but it blew up in their faces for reasons which, um, quite, well, it, as I say, it's quite complicated, but you can actually s simplify it quite a bit. In each of these orders, they had large peasant communities, and these peasant communities are always rebelling because of local grievances. The landlords taking their crops, for example, or taxation, or having to be conscripted. Now, for the king to centralize, he had to root around nobility. And that's the same in Russia, France, and China. To get around nobility and to communicate directly with the peasants so you can access all of the manpower of the, the political order in question. Mm -hmm. Now, in France, the king moved his bureaucracy into the villages and set up village um, communal um, sort of, um, I'm not even sure how you describe it, like village community uh, meetings. And in yeah. Russia, they did the same. They set up these political organizations. I, I, I forget the names in Russian, but um, there, there was, again, in village community um, organizations. And China tried to do the same as well. Now, what happened then was, example, the French is a really good example because when the French king set these up in the villages, he then invited the villagers to come to the meetings and to air their grievances. Mm 
which right. the villagers mistook as being the king giving them license to change their order so in which case they said oh we don't want this tax we don't want that tax and they assumed that that's the king letting them come together and just get rid of all these, these taxes so then that caused even more problems they started rebelling even more and then the whole thing just blew up in the king's face so a lot of the time it's the centralization starts it starts going wonky because they can't control it properly and yep. then the whole thing just collapses and okay. in the different orders there's different specific reasons why they collapse but that's basically it it's just a, a poorly managed centralization i mean on the other hand you get the example of imperial japan or um prussia which mm -hmm. managed to centralize far far more efficiently for quite complicated reasons but they managed to do it whereas so in france russia china they couldn't do it so centralization itself then is a possibly inevitable consequence of power in the first place and it depends on how you manage it it either destroys you or you you can sort of ride it like a like a bronco somehow or what well if, if you if you try to centralize and it fails you end up with a revolution and then revolution happens then eventually if the country still hold together whoever mm -hmm. is left at the end of it which is something juvenile makes a point of whoever's left at the end of it is left with an open play field all of right. the intermediaries, all of the ability, all of the things which are halting power in the first instance have been burned away by the revolution. So that's why after the revolution, we end up with these movements or orders which are just all of a sudden hyper-centralized. For example, in France, you had Napoleon. In mm -hmm. Russia, you had the Communist Party. In China, again, you had the Communist Party. Once they're right. in power, then there's, there's no intermediaries to impede on them, to stop them. So then they centralize. And it's, it's, a, it's an absolute necessity, unfortunately, because of geopolitical necessity. If okay. one competitor centralizes and becomes more effective at fighting war as a result, mm -hmm. then the other orders are faced with having to centralize or they're going to be in a lot of trouble. A good example of that is um, Poland. Poland didn't manage to do that in the modern period. They, and they stayed as a, a, a noble republic for quite a long time, and they ended up getting carved apart. Um, so that's a good counterpoint. Okay, so what would you say, let me ask a two-part question. What would you say, in your opinion, studying all this, is the ideal state of a civilization or a, a society's management? And what would you say of, is the state of the centralization of our current empire, American empire? I think that's a hard question to answer because it's going to depend specifically on um, what technology is available in a given order and and just the general organization. Because I mean, yeah. for example, again, going back to the revolution examples, because they're really good. Oh. Um, Russia tried to centralize. So it tried to, it, well, for example, after the Crimean war, war, the Russians order realized that they were in trouble because they only had wooden sailing ships against the French and British iron ships, and they just they got beaten pretty badly. So they realized that centralization was pretty much a necessity because they were so backwards. Right. So that's after that we get the emancipation of the serfs, which was driven by the Tsar. Now, when, as I said, when he did that, he set up local political organizations to route around nobility so that it would be a, a direct connection between himself and the localities, which is something he needed to do to try and centralize. But impeding that would have been the nobility, and the nobility would not have been happy with that. And that's exactly the same pattern you find in France and in China. Okay. Now, when the nobility is unhappy with centralization and they have the ability to fight back politically, then you have a lot of trouble because then things start to end up in conflict. Right. And if it ends up in sufficient conflict and the central powers are unable to control um, the situation, then again, they collapse. Whereas, for example, in Japan, you had this situation where because the, 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 the samurai um, and the, the merchants were kept very separate, you had a situation where the merchants didn't have any political power. So for the samurai, for example, were in government and all of their income came from the government. They weren't allowed to own land. They couldn't uh, operate businesses, I think, at first. 
-hmm. whereas the merchants they could do all that but they were not allowed anywhere near government so when the, the japanese centralized they could centralize even if the merchants weren't happy they didn't have any political position or any place where they could gather together to cause trouble right. whereas in other orders that tends to happen so that's why the japanese were able to centralize very efficiently and very organized now what i think is that i think if the society or the order has to centralize due to geopolitical necessity then the best thing to best thing to do would be to make sure that that centralization is as orderly effective and as less damaging as possible mm -hmm. which is what i'm trying to hopefully achieve with my thinking so i can't really prescribe a specific level of centralization which should happen or shouldn't happen okay. because it's always very dependent on circumstances okay. and even after centralization i don't think centralization can happen can maintain itself hyper centralization can maintain itself for very long at all anyway it always devolves down into decentralization it has to because whenever you have a centralized order come into being it then has the problem of government and it has to devolve government because it cannot control government centrally nobody's mm -hmm. been able to do that i mean right. you could make the argument with modern technology that that could be done for example with um the internet now uh, social media direct contact I me mean, everybody's got a phone now you can contact everybody immediately you've got a wealth of information but even yeah. then i don't believe massive wide-scale centralization is still possible um for a long term and i think it causes a massive amount of problems and even uh, either way even in even now even though we do have a hyper centralized order it is still devolved to a large degree which i think is one of the main causes of the problems which we're seeing in america at the moment uh, with the election right right okay so you don't you can't prescribe an ideal state anyways um like for me it would be the greek model of being of the spiritual the spiritual king and things happening for what we would consider silly or abstract reasons but uh, like it's, it's like that constant war between the the merchant class and the priestly warrior class that people talk about like that's more putting us maybe symbolic um like looking at it archetypically or something but i mean to me i can see that in it maybe and i would i would i would think the merchant class should be suppressed for a more culturally virile society anyways but that's apart from no that's apart totally apart from strictly looking at power and the necessities of survival and war geopolitical you know state of constant conflict that exists in the world i guess in our current state of so you you would say we're our, so everything is like it goes back and forth between centralization and that devolves and then there's more of a yeah so it's, it's like re re reiterating uh, system system where you have centralization and it has to uh, it has to devolve by necessity and then you have the next level of centralization where if it needs to try again then it has to undermine the the the, the intermediaries which is previously put in place so it ends up be in a continuous situation like that because it, it, what juvenile's political theory implies and what it seems to indicate is that humans like humans have specific anthropology which is actually quite uh, it's quite significant it's like actually quite profound it's something which i haven't been able to go into much detail myself but uh, adam gans and uh, adam Katz and uh, gans and the anthropomorphic guys have been have gone into this and um uh, the, 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 the anthropology of uh, René Girard as well is, in, is, is, is in, intrinsic to this because what he seems to imply is that humans psychology or language everything about us is all centered around a center external to ourselves which is something which is quite hard to understand but when you go look at for example things like sacrifice it actually starts to make a lot of sense because if human psychology and everything about us, including power, is centralized about an external center, for example, the sacrificial center, then that explains a lot. It explains why sacrifice was always so central to the older orders, why all of the older orders never thought that the king could actually make law, but could only discover it from the sacrificial center. And it also explains a lot of things regarding the development of language. It also explains money as well, because as I said, money comes from sacrifice it comes from the sacrificial order it was actually uh, all of the vocabulary comes directly from greek sacrifice uh, 
Right. Um, so even money, which is supposedly an anarchistic thing, is something which is predicated on centralization of something outside of us, which also happens with power. It's only in the later period when kings went into that center and acted as if they were the center. Mm -hmm. That's why we get sovereignty. Right. And originally, apparently, uh, supposedly, according to Graves, anyways, and many others, the the original ancient kings were themselves sacrificed every year. Uh, kings and yeah. queens, they, they, they took the office for a year and then they were killed. I think it, I think yeah, it was a year. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in your 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 neck of the woods in Ireland, I, I know you've uh, pulled lots of bodies out of the bog, which seems to be from kings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were killed. I mean, that was you got the power for a year, and then, and you knew it when you took the office, and that was the real. So as you said, it wasn't. I mean, in that case, in particular, it wasn't about individual power. You were making a sacrifice in becoming the king. Absolutely, you were, mm. and you had yeah, to be sacrificed. Yeah. yeah, but I, yeah. I think like, some of you are talking in approval of those original ways which are the really creative ways i think would is would be in line with mine i would be all about you know having a pagan monarch <laughs> as opposed to being ruled by bankers and things you know as as much as you can um but um what was i going to say so you would say oh in the in our current system right now are you would you say we are like at the at the cusp of um, are in the middle of serious degeneration or it seems like there's almost the centralization is at, still at the height of its power and maybe even increasing power to me but what would you say what what i think is that i think the presidency is the seat of centralization i think orders are centralized quite drastically and around this centralization we've had um many different institutions set up to help decentralization. So we have the media in the form of the free press. We have yeah. corporations and the idea of an economy, which is a very new idea. It's, mm. it's exceptionally new. It's very hard to find much reading on this, but it is very new. Um, and you have the the, the, the the bureaucracy, obviously, that dates back to the 17th, 16th century, which in its name implies a, 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 a what would you call it? You're getting rid of the aristocracy and you're changing it for the bureaucracy. And that's yeah. where the name bureaucracy comes from. So right. you have the media, you have the um, the, the bureaucracy, uh, you have corporations, and you have foundations as well, the tax exam foundations. Um, all of these things, universities as well, all of these things are kind of like the, the, what's come after the centralization pushed forward by, for, for example, the presidency in America. Now, what's happened is it seems like the presidency and technology now has made it so that these intermediaries are no longer particularly necessary. So the presidency, if in the hands of somebody who was capable, and it seems like maybe in the future it's going to happen anyway because of necessity, especially if China causes geopolitical pressure, then the presidency will be the seat of a further centralization, which will involve the presidency going around the intermediaries, which is kind of something which they kind of almost get at the moment, which is why you see this massive conflict between the presidency of Trump and all of these intermediaries, because they are intermediaries for the presidency. So right. if you have somebody in the future who could take up the presidency, who knew what they were doing and had a better understanding, you could see a lot of change. And I think, as I say, technology seems to imply that this change is going to be coming, especially with social media and the internet. Okay, through the inevitable um, election of a savvy president who understands power and how it works, you mean? Or through the influence of everybody on the internet? Well, at the moment, we've got uh, we've got a situation where the, whoever was put into the presidency was always heavily monitored. So that when they got into the presidency, they wouldn't really do much different. They would just follow the script as it right. already was, as set out by... The intermediaries i mean this is what always happens this happened with the kings as well as i said the kings were actually very weak so they'd get into power they'd be in their court but their ability to do much would be curtailed by the nobility so for example if the king wanted to go to war say the king of england wanted to go to war with france he'd have to go to the nobility and say to them can you come with me to this uh, go to war we've got an agreement a lot of time like feudalism they have an agreement like 30 days of war for example so you go to the nobility and say, look, you have to come and fight with me for 30 days on this war. Bring your men as well. And mm -hmm. the nobility would go along, maybe. And then after 30 days, he'd probably say, can you stay with me? And he'd be like, most of them would probably say no and just go home. 
So his ability to do much was highly limited. So right. the kings would have set around themselves people who they could rely on, rely on directly. So the, the, the court would have set up a set of bureaucracy, would have promoted common people to be um, close to him because he could guarantee that they would work for him. So it's, it's the high and low against the middle structure, which we see all of the time. Now, if you fast forward to the present period, and you've got a president in the presidency who wants to do or wants to make changes, all of the other intermediaries, the, the bureaucracy, the press, the foundations, all of them, the, the special secret services included, all of them would block him. And they'd only let somebody into that position of power who would know this situation wouldn't rock the boat in any serious way. But if you did get somebody in there wanted to do that, then they have to follow the same procedure which everybody else has done, engage in high and low versus the middle, which is right. something Trump, if he was co competent in political maneuvering, mm -hmm. he would have done that. He would have completely, I mean, he tried to do that with Twitter. He used Twitter as a means to call, talk directly to people so he could get around the media, the press. Yeah. But uh, eventually, the intermediaries managed to draw things like Twitter and social media into the intermediary structure, which is what we see now with Trump being deplatformed from everywhere. Okay, so the if power that then, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. But the power wielded by the intermediaries or the nobles and the central power, they themselves must surely not all be in agreement on what to do or how to do it. So this is what I meant. I had no, a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, see, with Trump, Trump, with the, the Trump situation is complete chaos. I mean, yeah, yeah. everybody seems to have a general idea of what everybody else is doing or what to do with him, but yeah. it's not being done very in a very sophisticated way at all. <laughs> no, it's no. a mess. But in general, though, that that says this. That was uh, one of my original questions about centralization: is that it's sort of, is it a headless machine of sorts, or do they? Is there like, if our current crop of nobles, these intermediaries, the, the bu bureaucracy, um. Uh, is there like a they they can't possibly have a secret king who's absolutely dictating what happens? So in a sense, are they just like a wild frenzied chaos force for whatever? It's, it's, it whatever kind of. Can. I wouldn't say it's like you could bring class analysis into this because you wouldn't really call them a class. I mean, right. I, I think there's been a specific name given to them in in, in a sort of similar light. Is they all operate in the same areas they all have the same right? for example if you put somebody into a given position they're yeah. going to act in relation to that given position that's just the nature of people so if you put somebody in a bureaucracy they're going to act as a bureaucrat they're going to act in very specific ways which can actually be quite predictable yeah. which is something you'll find with these intermediaries they act in very predictable ways they're yeah. trying to increase their own position they're trying to increase their own power um, and they also want to keep things as they are. They don't want things to change too much at all. They want to maintain their position. Right. So obviously it's everybody's interest not to have somebody in the presidency who's going to make any wide sweeping changes. Because imagine if you had somebody in the presidency who then decided, we don't need the CIA, we don't need this bureaucracy, we don't need this bureaucracy. That right. would not be beneficial to them. Everybody's part of the... I'm going to say scam, but everybody's got their finger in the pie. So nobody right. wants the pie taken away. So it's a, it's a strong effort to keep keep things as they are in many ways. Pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. So, and it, it flashes out against anything that might want to change that. So that's pretty yeah. understandable to everybody as the nature of a thing. Even though they yeah. seem to have a kind of specific agenda or they inevitably lead down certain the trend leads leads them down a, another route which again plays into what i was saying uh about my what i think about power as like a a bizarre like the greeks would have thought of it as a bizarre current that moves through the world following its own patterns that you can kind of observe or try to take note of but it like like a trend a cultural trend what is it it's it's very powerful it seems it follows like we can we can get we can um, predict what it's going to do we can guess, we can see. It's like observing an animal, you know, observing the, the patterns you see like in spiders or antelopes or something. This is my- It's, 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 it's quite interesting because it, it kind of overlaps, the juvenile overlaps quite a lot with Marxism. Because obviously with Marxism, you have class analysis. Mm 
yeah. that every you have classes who end up with class consciousness because they all have the same incentives the same wants the same general outlook on the world and you see this for example china the chinese revolution is actually quite an interesting example the thing which sparked off the chinese revolution which surprisingly to me i didn't notice the thing that sparked it off was that the emperor was trying to buy up all of the railways in all of the different provinces so you could centralize the railway system and uh, make it obviously more efficient and more centralized which is something you need to do for warfare at that time because yeah, rail, yeah. the railway network was logistics now what happened in one of the regions the local nobles were very much against this because they had all heavily invested in railways so if the, the emperor comes on and buys all of those railways they've lost their investment and yeah. they started off the revolution because of that because they were resentful of the emperor tried to take away their investments and this happened in many other provinces so the chinese revolution happened because of railway investments bizarrely <laughs> enough so yeah, they yeah. they didn't all plan that all of these regions didn't plan that revolution it just happened because the emperor was trying to centralize and in doing so he was starting to rock the boat and all of the people who were going to be cut out because of this yeah. all acted in pretty much the same way yeah so I, that would that follows along with that. you're looking at an abstract force even though it's like cultural and trending human behavior just like the greeks would have given it a, a name and called it god and in fact i believe the chinese have a god of bureaucracy i don't remember his name in the old uh, chinese religion i believe i read that before so it's like a force and you it name it you try to try to <laughs> predict its habits because it's not like i mean you know, there's no, there's it's, no it's, example with friends as well in which france yeah there's another example of the french revolution as well okay um the french king was um um what was he doing he was trying to centralize and uh, yeah. what happened was previous to the french revolution maybe 60 years before i'm going back the king would always borrow significant amounts of money from financiers bankers yeah and then when he got bankrupt he'd call a i think it's called a chamber of justice i think it was and right. then he'd just make everybody go against the financiers right. as a way to wipe out the debt. Right. So, but the problem was they ended up getting integrated into government. So by the time of the French Revolution, the king was bankrupt. Right. He he needed to call his chamber of justice, but he couldn't do it because they had a lot of leverage over him. So right. then he was stuck basically bankrupt, which is one of the contributing factors to the French Revolution, which Another. is something I find interesting because the, it, because they were able to get integrated within the government the king's ancient ability to wipe out debt was taken away from them right which is another thing which kings were always always supposed to be doing they're always supposed to engage jubilees and wipe out everybody's debt so you would say then since the time of say the renaissance till now though there is an unbroken ascension or increase in the power of money and the merchant or economy class is or not would you say that yeah yeah because it one of the in fact one of the most efficient ways to study european history is to study coinage as bizarre as that sounds um if you follow the development of coinage the spread of coinage and the way it's been used and the, the rates of inflation you can trace the centralization of a particular order because once because at the beginning money was introduced well he had money in the roman order then the roman order collapsed obviously and the germans took over the western european region but they didn't yeah. use money money completely disappeared for a long time and then the kings started to implement money again but this was implemented at the encouragement of christian uh, missionaries uh, christian um, advisors strangely enough it right. seems like Christianity is very entwined with money. So they were the ones who advised the king to ish, mint money, issue money, because once he issued money, minted money, he could then start engaging with the order around him using money, instead of again, having to go to the nobles and say, can you come to me and fight with me? Instead, he could just buy mercenaries and then he could do what he wanted, or he can pay for employees to work as um, bureaucrats for him. Right. Um, so with the increase of monetization monetization is always pushed by central power it's always pushed by the kings nobody ever wants to use money it's not a natural thing at all 
right. every single order is always pushed it's always they go to the peasants and say you need to pay tax now and then yeah. the peasants are stuck and they're like well, okay now i need to go sell my crops in the market and get money to pay this tax they don't interact with each, they didn't interact with each other with money they always did it with debt because people have memories they don't need money to interact with each other it's like if you if you interact with your friends you don't interact monetarily you don't pay your friends to do stuff you right, do stuff right. you remember it the next time they'll say oh you did that i'll do something for you right previously yeah. everybody lived in smaller villages smaller orders so people could rely on what they had in their head to remember how to organize themselves it's only right. when the the central power comes along and starts spreading throughout the rest of the territory and starts getting yeah. into those villages that's when you start getting money because it's the kings forcing everybody to monetize yeah that's very interesting yeah that reminds me yeah because that's what the way i would instinctually feel about it is that yeah it, and your own interaction should be that kind of natural give and take that you keep track of yourself and that the evil the encroaching evil is the rise of the the accountant let's say who tries to put everything mathematically on paper in that way and quantify everything which is really just a kind of structural power control of its own that increases its own its own grasp on on your life and like i always think like i always write i'm always talking about art i wrote a book about art and all that that sort of plays into it as well where you kind of reduce what is a natural kind of organic thing interaction between people and try to quantify it you know in that sort of and what we would think of now is that hyper american way where everything is everything can be valued by its market predictable market um reaction let's say and every and this is what destroys culture as well like i think this the increase of this kind of thinking that everything can be managed monetarily so you might say it's, it's mammon is real as a god and this is his ascension <laughs> yeah and one of the, the major problems with this the major problem with hyper centralization and the mass monetization of a uh, political orders is it makes them extremely fragile and yeah. it takes away I, I, i'd say i don't know if, have you seen anything by um samuel boya no. he's on he's, he's on twitter i'm not sure if you've seen anything by him but he, he's, he's made the distinction recently between what he calls live players and dead players dead yeah. players are basically actors within society um who can't make their own decisions and can't do new things so bureaucrats would be a good example of dead actors they can't do anything new they have a script they go by the script but live right. actors are those who can face a situation and come up with something completely creative and new so right. for example elon musk is the one given i think i believe yeah. a lot because he yeah. yeah he can make new decisions he can make new things yeah. what, what we have with hyper centralization and uh, mass monetization like that i think you have a situation where live actors are removed from society which makes a society exceptionally fragile so i mean if you look at like roman history in a sense roman history is a case where at the start it had many live actors many different people were able to actually do new things for example caesar he basically went off by himself and conquered gaul you have many generals like that who would by their own initiative go along and do something completely new but by the older era by the end of the roman period it's completely dead there's nothing there's no life to it it's just maintained the political structure as it is maintain the borders and it's just very drab yeah. very gray well uh, i don't I think mean, they, i, I don't I think saw... they ever reached a, a, a dead drabness at, at the level we've reached now i mean even uh, even when i read about the decline of rome in the early dark ages after it it still seems sort of lively in that way they didn't have the attitude to life that we have now which is even more like a really totalitarian centralization uh belief, belief system i think but uh i didn't yeah, I, know. I believe that at the end period though, they were very highly centralized they were very monetized they were very broken down many of the aspects that made rome at the start quite interesting were just no longer there anymore for yeah. example uh, I, I think one of the one of the one of the key ones would have been like the centurions i didn't realize how widespread the centurions power was i just presume centurions were just the leader of the particular battle formation and that was it but they yeah. actually had quite a lot of uh, authority outside of that especially um, in the case of giving uh, law um, um, administration and just generally all those things so they were in a sense they 
a lot of the time they were live actors they had a lot of authority and yeah. they could only be i believe they're actually only allowed to be um, promoted to the position of centurion at the um, discretion of the emperor he had to be the one to choose it but by right. the later period there's no more centurions i mean the word right. centurion kind of exists but only as an administrative name for against somebody administering 100 troops but they have is this, is this after the is, is this after the split east and west or before I, it, it's hard to say it would have been like a somewhere around about that time because when, the when they split, they the, East, the East became like the new creative force in a way, and the West just kind of fell apart completely. Yeah, I think a lot of it is due to the fact that you, you, if, you, if you look at it in more detail, you see that the people in intermediary positions, they don't seem to have much decision-making um, ability. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. there seems to be a lot of problem with managing the emperor, empire at that time, because they... They were constantly splitting the empire up into different um, regions for different emperors to control, which kind yeah. of indicates to a large degree that they were having serious management problems, which I think would have been due to their inability to devolve uh, government and devolve decentralization uh, effectively. So they ended right. up constantly chopping and changing the empire. So they failed. You know, a lot of times they you failed have three emperors at once. They failed to create a new centralization, basically. They needed to adapt. And change their centralization uh, is that i'd say they needed to centralize again and then decentralize and uh, uh, give okay. power to intermediaries to act of their own volition they act more right. flexibly i just I think, think by the end of the roman period everything was frozen in place i don't think there's anybody making anything new or anybody doing anything yeah new. right right the stultification which is what we're doing now you can see with our movies and our culture yeah. everything's dead it's, it's kind of died in place yeah. and it's like you can't escape it. I remember I read a book once a um, long time ago on uh, the Sahara. I was on the Sahara and it was talking, it was not, it was only incidentally about Rome. It mentioned them a few times, but it was talking about how the cities in the desert um, in Africa that the Romans built. And it was basically just to, to they go there on a war, just, 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 just links to what you were saying about centurions. And like each one was trained basically to not just go into a place and fight and invade it and take it over, but then to, mm -hmm basically if left basically on his own even to create a kind of roman extension city and they would like dig giant they would do whatever it took they were fully trained to be farmers they would dig a giant well in the desert yeah. just irrigate the desert and make a green city out of nothing and these are just oh, the soldiers, could, like, soldiers acting on yeah. their own oh the centurions the, the centurions were incredible their engineering capability of a, a given legion was ast uh, astonishing they yeah, could create like, giant yeah. six six story high siege equipment and they could for example see the siege of elysia is a really good example where caesar built a, i think it was like a 16 kilometer wall around elysia and then as he was being attacked from outside he then built another one which was like 30 kilometers around uh, right. facing the opposite way so he built two walls i mean That's these amazing. weren't like just picket fences these were major fortifications with towers and everything and he did it within a couple of days so each legion had its ability to engineer incredible amounts of things but by the late period you didn't have that you just had you had german troops which were put into the army which yeah. had very basic weaponry i don't think they were capable of engaging in anything like that any engineering capabilities and then you had some german mercenaries maybe and it was just it was very yeah it was just a night and day yeah this is yeah. nothing there it couldn't yeah. seem to do anything new yeah they lost the importance the, what's important in their culture became lost in the i guess in when the centralization failed they they failed to c continue their culture train themselves as they used to i can only guess as part of it. but um yeah, I, yeah i think when you get centralization the centralization if it's not decentralized effectively by the central or uh, central power then again you end up with this stultification if power is not able to devolve properly if there's just something wrong there then they cannot give power to live actors who can actually do something and keep that society and keep that order alive they just end up just coasting just fossilized they just, right. just yeah no, they, they can't do anything new and so, this good art to make the americas just like that right now as you said so if we can notice this and see these patterns and 
uh, observe this. So in what way can we, I mean, it's just like, okay, we can see how it works in a way. And it's say, so the top and the bottom, not that the top and the bottom are irrelevant, but you have to examine more the middle management area for true power. What, how would you hijack it and get it back and back, you know, manage the, manage the way out of a fall of centralization back into a new golden age of Greek kings? <laughs> It's, it's, I, don't, I don't think there's any way to actually actively decide what you want to do in this situation. I just think that lots of it is taken out of our hands completely. All we can do is try and make the process which is going to come more, well, less damaging, basically. So, for right. example, as I said, I give the example with um, the the. the, the the, the First World War period, or the period leading up to it, was a period of massive centralization. You had the Russians needing to centralize, which caused their revolution. The Chinese needed to centralize, which caused their revolution. But the Japanese and the Germans managed to do it effectively and didn't tear their societies apart. So all of them were going to end up in the same place regardless. It's just if you help whichever order get to that position without causing as much damage as possible, right. which is what I was hoping I could do with my thought to a degree. Because, I mean, yeah. and also even, even when things go bad, like, for example, the Chinese and the Russian revolutions both went very bad. The Chinese yeah. was not as bad as the Russians. And the reason for that was because the Chinese actually learned from the Russians' mistakes. Because right. when the Russians were trying to extract resources from the peasant class, they went about it in um, the wrong way. And when they tried to industrialize their society as well, they went about it in very much the wrong way. For example, they tried to. They tried. They tried to create. Um, I think they tried to try, tried to follow like Western theory and tried to make free markets. Tried to create a, 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 an economy based on demand, which just didn't work. Whereas mm -hmm. the Chinese just invested heavily in heavy industry and did a state-centric approach, and they also didn't force the peasants off the land in such the way that the Russians did. So they actually followed the Russians, what the Russians were doing, and they actually changed their plans accordingly, which I, I think is about the best we can hope for at this point. So I'm thinking, right. yeah, I, I think, I, I don't think any of the order, any anybody in any of the political orders in the West at the very least understands the effect which modern technology is having and the implications it's going to have on centralization. So yeah. I don't think any of them fully grasp the internet and social media uh, as it is and how it's a, a means for centralization. I mean, for example, again, if we go back to Trump, he was able to completely bypass the entire system with just Twitter. Yeah. Now, they've grasped that finally, that they needed to shut his Twitter down. But in doing so, you create even more problems because our, our whole order is based on the idea that everybody's free, we have free yeah. speech and everybody's got yeah. But then if he's banned from Twitter and he's clearly banned and blocked from everything, yeah. that goes completely against the under the very basis of our Western civilization. Yeah. So So they're naked, it's they're a exposed. Mess. Yeah, it is yeah. nice. Yeah. So in terms of um the structure of society, like so we can you and I can sell our books and we can, you know, get patrons just being our just being ourselves and talking our thoughts online. You totally totally bypass not just you know the entire system we could we could not go to university we could not have to worry about getting jobs corporate jobs so that's the kind of change maybe that's needs to be understood uh, as much as you can understand that's the, that, that that's your prediction this cultural yeah. whatever whatever it means and wherever it would might lead yeah every time you have new media situ um, new media come into play then you have new means of um, centralization i mean yeah. first you had writing well before writing sorry you had money Money was yeah. a means of centralization. It's not a natural thing. Then you had the printing press. That becomes a means of centralization. Then you have TV, radio. Each time you have these different medias, you have different waves of centralization. And now we've got the internet and social media. It's, um, it's made things exceptionally unstable. Now, yeah. I mean, with the previous print media, TV media, and all of that, things were kept in check by the intermediaries. So yeah. the, the, the editors could keep things in check. They could control who got into the press, who yeah. got into the news. Yeah. 
and they could keep control on who was potentially going to be the president. So whoever got into presidency would not cause trouble or try to break off by themselves. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, neither, it's, it's the same thing as the kings with the nobility. The nobility yeah. would have tried to keep close control over the king so the king wouldn't try to pull away from them. Right. But then, unfortunately, that did happen. The kings managed to pull away from them, and they managed to use things such as money to do that. So we have that with the presidency in America. We have the, the media who have been able to keep them in control for a long time, and the whole system is kept very stable. So the media keeps them in control. The bureaucracy can do what he says or not do what he says. I mean, a good example is Syria. He wanted troops taken out of Syria. Yeah. His bureaucracy and the military said, yeah, okay, they're gone. But they didn't move a thing. They just lied to him. So he's completely reliant on intermediaries. So, right. but if you have somebody get into that position of power who understands all this and does want to break away, then there's nothing stopping them from doing it. Really, they, I right. mean, they would have to do other things than Twitter. I mean, Twitter is no longer a possibility anymore. He'd have to set up his own communication channel. I mean, I've seen some people mention something like the president could set up their like president app. And that way to be able to contact everybody completely indirectly, which <laughs> you become a shadow just, president, the online shadow president. Yeah, I mean it's like yeah, there's so many technological potentials there for him to, but he, I don't think he's got the ability to do this or the, the, the that political acumen. I don't think he's the person, but I think in the future yeah. maybe we'll see someone, or maybe we we'll see somebody from the order right now already. If there's a geopolitical pressure which demands that centralization occurs for whatever reason, then we'll see explosive centralization or revolution when everything collapses in on itself. That's always right. the instigator for centralization, geopolitical conflict. Right. Well, as a personal, um, my, and your, yourself included, I would say just observer of patterns, um, I would say it's, it's in, that time is, uh, I, don't, I don't know how near it is, but it's increasing and it's it's rapidly coming upon us um it's it's you can see it and you can see it at the end of the tunnel let's say um right. i want to ask you one more thing sorry oh, sorry yeah go on no i was gonna go say on. we've also got the major problem as i said that the, the ability to control the social media is the, the, it falls back on two basic means one is to try and manipulate it from the background which obviously has failed drastically there's right. no editors as such who can control it in the background because yeah. it's social media. Well, look, 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 look at what you and I are doing right now. Like this is not, yeah, we're not exactly. doing anything too uh, criminal, <laughs> but yeah. we're certainly speaking our minds absolutely frankly and anyone can watch it. Yeah, That's it. and the, yeah. the other option is deplatforming, but deplatforming, right. it just goes completely against the very fundamental basis of our political orders, unless they can frame that deplatforming in such a way that it matches with the political order. Mm. But I, struggle to see how i mean it's i really struggle to see how they can do that i mean at the moment if they're lucky in that for example and that trump is not a leader of genius he's not he's not a napoleon or anything like that no he's a yeah he's a he's a merchant basically he was <laughs> Oh. Yeah, he he, 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 went to yeah. He, he thought he was a king. He could get in, tell everybody what to do, to do what he says, and then nothing happened. He still didn't get it. He just yeah, did his, not have that power. His so, flaws were the flaws he started out with that were always a thorn in his side, and like silly things like his ridiculous hair and things that, like, you know, all the women hated him. <laughs> it felt like just because he, you know, he was kind of rude and looked r ridiculous. Silly, silly little factors like this that kind of, but that's like his personality. He's just this. You know, we don't need to talk about him. The thing is, conflict tends to produce people who are capable, though. For example, the Russian Revolution eventually produced a Stalin. The Chinese yeah. Revolution eventually produced Mao. And the French Revolution eventually produced Napoleon. So right. obviously Trump is not one of them. But in, yeah. fu in the future, when thing if things do end up becoming even worse, one of them will probably come forward if the U.S. stays as it is. If we could somehow mitigate that um and not allow things to devolve worse than they are that would be a major win but i don't think that's something that's going to be happening anytime soon because as you see with the response to trump is complete disaster it's catastrophe i mean there's yeah. yeah it's ridiculous well i would see everything that happens as necessity necessitas the goddess 
destiny. Anyways, and then one thing leads to another in invariably. But like, what do you think about the fact that people today, many of them, maybe most in the West at least, have been more so than they ever were in the past, I think, even though you had serfs and everything, have been made so so docile and sort of these pod people that are more than happy to take orders at every turn as a, like you, you you're saying well there's a point where things will collapse and people will sort of revolt mm -hmm. like how, how much farther can that go I, or what do you think about that i i, I well, the thing is i say if you look at revolutions and revolts they always stem from local issues they're not like for example with the french revolution everybody seems to think that everybody suddenly went oh we, we all want liberty equality um, and all of that and then they all started rebelling no they didn't what happened was the peasants were obviously upset with the local nobles because they were taking their, 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 their taxes and then other taxes and other feudal dues and all sorts of things they were yeah. always very against that there's also yeah. and in the cities the riots were always due to bread lack of bread supplies right always right. lack of bread so that's what caused all of the revolutions it's always right. local economic issues local problems so right. in the west if that's going to happen it's going to be stemmed it's going to stem from economic issues so but something silly it'll, it'll literally be like the price of bread or something silly like that and yeah and but, but at the moment it seems weird because i mean i say I, in the west everybody's locked in their houses uh, uh, lots of people are pretty much lost income they've lost so much money but so uh, it, just, it just makes me wonder what's going to be the actual spark that eventually sets it off what actually does that and it's going to it's going to be some sort of failed attempt to centralization which is going to be the instigator for all of this which is going to cause conflict between the centralizing power and the intermediaries and they're going to use it's going to cause problems for normal people and they're going to cause even more problems and it's just going to collapse basically if it's going to happen right yes well we are just these humble observers of patterns i guess but I do think you've done like uh, you, when I was hearing and reading about your book and the subject, I just thought, well, that's very that is very, very pertinent and interesting. I don't know how many people really grasp it, like to think of power and to look at power specifically on its own, uh, on its own terms, let's say, is requires a real objective standing back rational uh, observer, let's say. So you, I think you did. You made a good choice there. But um, I wanted to ask you in your Twitter bio, you've got anti philosophy, which I find yeah. alarming. Alarming. <laughs> what's what's that all about? Philosophy and money come together at the same time. Really? They both originate in militus. It's only when you get money that people start to think of philosophy. Because prior to that, they just basically, I want to say they didn't think of the world around them, but they took it as a given. I mean, they had mythology and they had. Uh, yeah, different myths, but they didn't think of uh, what, because what happens when you get money is then everybody's order around them starts to go very strange. People will start, you start getting the philosophers who start thinking maybe there's a world behind this world, which um, Richard Seaford, uh, as a, a, a British academic, I believe, he, he wrote a lot on this. He makes the point that if you look at early Greek philosophy, when they start thinking about this world beyond the world, it's basically like a mirroring of the monetary economy. Because the monetary economy, money, coinage, becomes that world behind the world. So, for example, if you go from one place, you have a vase, and you sell that vase, you get the coin. And you go away, and you go buy some bread with that coin. You've just transferred that vase into bread. And this, you've got this weird world behind it, like this, 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 this strange world behind it. So this bread and this vase is like the immediate world, but then there's actually a, a further world behind it. So that's when you start getting philosophical thought. Uh, it's, 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 it's not a coincidence that money and philosophy originate at the same time. It's when people right. start to basically apply the logic of money to the world. So that's when you get things like the, 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 the famous example of the river, I think it's River Pidness, isn't it? But I forget the philosopher was like trying to decide: is it the, ri the river really still there? Because it's always changing. And it's oh, just, uh, Heraclitus, it's Heraclitus, Heraclitus. Yeah, yeah. a man, yeah. man never steps in the same river twice because he's never the same man, and it's never in the same river. Um, yeah, it, it all roots back to the change and the, the, the fluidity of coinage. 
Maybe, maybe. I'm not sure on that one. I don't know if I agree with you on that one, but uh, yeah, it could be sort of like money is symbolic and it leads into like Plato's forms about objects. I don't know. A world without philosophy, a philosophy to me, would be very less rich and it would be one of the things I would choose to defend greatly. Um, the thing is, I've got a lot more, I've got more time and respect for the Greek philosophers, yeah. not so much modern philosophers. I really cannot stand any of them, basically. I, I love. I spend a lot of time in the book as well, tr picking apart people like De 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 Descartes. I always yeah. pronounce his name wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because th their philosophy is actually, I say it's wrong. It's just very, very. It's just very, very lacking in self-reflection. Because a lot of the yeah. philosophy f ideas they come along with, and especially in ethics and especially in uh, epistemology, yeah, it's based upon concepts and categorizations of existence, which are they're born into, but which they don't realize are not timeless. Right. They actually yeah. have a specific yeah. time in which those categories, like for example, the individual forms a major part of my book, analyzing the individual. The idea that there is something such as an individual is a very modern thing. I mean, there's, there, many people make the case that the Greeks and the ancients had the concept of an individual, but it was very different to our modern concept of the individual. Yeah. The individual comes about because what happens is with the development of sovereignty, you end up with new forms of epistemology coming into being because of the conflict between the high and the middle and the low. Yeah. Because so, so what happens is you end up with this individual being created. This, uh, I think his name is Larry Siddentop. He wrote a book about this, where it was the invention of the individual. It comes along in maybe you could say the 13th, 14th, 15th century, that type of period. And it's very much entwined with the development of theories of sovereignty. Because once you get the theories of sovereignty, you need an individual which ties in with that sovereign. So you end up with things like... Um, Hobbes's theory of sovereignty that all of these individuals came together and decided upon the king or came yeah. together and made society that's yeah. all necessary individual is necessary for that political theory and also the, the breaking up of society requires the creation of individuals the freeing of these individuals as well i mean the whole concept of freedom is if you go back in history freedom meant that, that you were made free from your local obligations by the king so you yeah. weren't free simpliciter you were free in relation to your local obligations but you're still a subject of the king yeah. that's the yeah. same with the individual the individual yeah. now is free in relation to the government yeah you're not but free simpliciter yeah. I, I agree there's definitely certain constructs involved in believing you are both e egotistically like inside your head and externally in the world that are definitely manufactured false and ultimately detrimental but yes yeah. the greeks of all the philosophers the greeks obviously who are like you know we are champions of philosophies because they they were just doing i thought a really natural uh, in, an innocent but intellectual observance of the world and sort of from all of them like from you know um euclid to Py pythagoras i mean all of them they were just it was like an observance and making personal notes on the world yeah, my and argument in the book is that what happened was that their political order, the, the structure of Greek society was changing rapidly due to this monetization. And because they were in that change, that flux, they were, had one foot in the old order and one foot in the new order. Right. And that, that point allowed them to see things somewhat differently and allowed them to, that made them have to think about the world around them differently, which is right. something as well which... Um, uh, other, other, other writers have made the point on, especially in relation to ethics. That happens a lot in ethics. Ethics is a very good example, actually, um, because um, Alistair McIntyre makes this point. I, I cover him a lot in the book. Modern ethics basically make no sense. We are <laughs> unable to define good and bad. And he, his way of explaining it and his way of define, uh, explaining how this happened is actually quite elegant. In older orders, before monetization, everybody had a specific role within their society. Their role was very clear. So yeah. if something was somebody was good or bad, it depended on how well they met their role. So good and bad was evaluative. 
right? Like Alistair McIntyre used the example of a watch. If a watch is good, you can say a watch is good or bad, because if you can hold it, it can carry it, it's small, it tells the time, it's good. If it doesn't tell the time, it's bad. So it's a value to it. In older orders, everybody had a specific role. I'm not saying everybody was a watch, but they had a spirit, right, a husband, uh, a tribal leaf, or a tribal leader, sorry, or what have you. So yeah. if they were matching what they were supposed to do in that role, they were good. If they weren't, they were bad. Right. Now, with monetization, people's roles within society basically disappear. You don't really have any specific role. You, you become a monetized individual. Your interactions with everybody is monetized. Yeah. And so with the modern period, we can't then analyze, we can't, and we, we can't then evaluate somebody because everybody nobody has a specific role so we can't really say if they're good or bad yeah. so then we end up with philosophers starting to discuss what is good and what is bad i mean the greeks had that problem as well they ended up talking about good and bad as being uh, like nouns uh, things which existed external to ourselves as opposed to an evaluative category so the whole thing breaks apart and then we end up in a modern period where it's all broken apart Everybody along the steps, the different steps, does not realize it's completely broken apart. And we're right. left discussing things which basically don't make any sense, which is why ethics really don't make any sense. Well, I agree with a lot of that. I don't know that I, I still don't know that I would just tie it all down to philosophy and that it's somehow anything resembling a mistake or anything but a benefit to all of us. But I do, like I, you see, like in my book, I wrote about the guilds, the old uh, craft guilds, so I, and how that was counter in. in counter individuality and counter money in its way because they existed all through time they were all like through the entire period up until they they were broken apart so we get corporations and mass production basically you know if you wanted to be a whatever a shoemaker or a, a painter a flute player you were in the guild for that and you carried on your tradition going yeah. back the problem with was the guilds was after, after they, and an eso it was always an esoteric spiritual element to the whole yeah, thing that's the problem with it. it was it was no longer beneficial to centralized power so they were no longer yeah, yeah, yeah. so with the revolutions they were brushed aside they were blown away and instead right. we're left with people like Descartes and his egocentric philosophy okay yeah so well I mean there's some happens. philosophers that are yeah so some philosophy is you know philosophy can go here and there but even you and I are practicing practicing a kind of philosophy and talking about this and observing yeah, but the difference is between us and say for example Descartes Descartes was invited to the french king's court the swedish queen's court everybody's court he was fated by all of the uh, kings and queens and um, whereas we are not example, every, yeah exactly because yeah. we're of no use to them he, he, on the other hand he was very useful to them because he was promoting a, a system of philosophy which very much benefited their political ambitions and political um, processes of centralization so you end up with this process of patronage where, where well, i wouldn't say you would be like if if trump had been smarter you would be a very you would be like a jewel to him if he had uh <laughs> got his clutches on you and uh, brought you to his if, court I, yeah, yeah if if this, i mean really yeah. so, um, anyways we uh that was that was good i think we covered i mean maybe there's more we can cover but uh that's getting going on getting close to two hours so might stop it there um so thanks for coming on and explaining that. I don't know. Is there anything else you want to say before I? No, no. I think that pretty much covers it all. Plus it's yeah. one o'clock here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, that was great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Bond. No problem. And, uh, I don't know. Oh, one last thing I want to say. What is, if you were, um, what do you think of, so when you talk about technology changing things, sorry, I just forgot to ask this. Um, so what do you think about this business with like Bitcoin and all that and being able to make money that's obviously just an increase in the in the money distinction it's not really like getting away from it it's just getting worse probably is it in terms of money power bitcoin's weird and um, it's it's very clearly uh, a secret service uh, nsa project it's very oh, clearly really? it's, for its very origin is clearly one and oh, those okay. whenever you see any technology which is anarchistic or um heavily promoted this decentralizing and the like it's usually usually well if, if you pretty much 100 yeah. percent promoted by secret services or central power in some way shape or form okay right yeah. Yeah. like yeah. even tor browser for example that's i think that's pretty much an nsa project as well really? because wow. these, these things they always end up serving central power any any situation where it decentralizes because decentralization and individualization and separating everybody into individuals
is primarily a process of taking power away from intermediaries. So for example, as you said with guilds, if you break people down into individuals and they're no longer part of the guilds, then the guilds lose their power. They don't have any authority anymore. They're, they're broken apart. And you replace yeah. them with corporations, and corporations are weird because they're, they're just very weird things. I cover that in my book as well because every, okay. they, 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 they're like quasi intermediate, quasi anarchic kind of organizations. They try and pretend that they're anarchic. They're like, they're part of the free society, but in reality, you're actually at arms of government. So you end up with these different things like corporations or uh, the Tor or Bitcoin and things like that. Whenever anything is anarchistic and promoting the individual like that, it's always going to be some way linked to central power and beneficial to central power because it's a so, way to route around other institutions. So you don't see it accidentally evolving into something that gets us beyond what this evil of money as a concept? No, because anyway, it's money uh, itself. It is money, 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 money tree relationship. Yeah. The only way you get around that is uh, yeah, basically get rid of money and force people well, to live in these things. Sometimes these things evolve change. against. I, I find sometimes things evolve against themselves. This is part of the patterns of cultural changes, even without noticing. You know what I mean? Like it kind of it, it, it can accidentally evolve into something counter to what it's meant to be. I think that can apply to almost anything. Maybe that's yeah, another. I mean, world. the thing with Bitcoin is, it's like it's it's it's, it's basically a means to. Uh, into in, in, communicate and uh, means to interact with individuals who you don't need to know so it's mm. basically as i said it's just still money the only way yeah. you can get around that is to have small communities where everybody knows each other and they don't need money to interact with each other right which right. is something which people have been trying to do for quite a while now i mean the only one of the few groups which actually understood this to any sort of degree were the communists um, as obviously the name implies but yeah. when they got into power, one of the first things they did was to encourage mass monetization of their countries because they needed to. Right. No, I, I, and I don't mean to defend Bitcoin. I don't use Bitcoin. Or, I, I'm just sort of speculating wildly. I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to defend it. Be a, I've got no opinion on it, really. I never got involved in it. But um, yeah, but I do. what I do advocate is returning to like the polis, the city state, if there's any way that is more more idea and to like I, I picture a future world where there's like some city states and they're going back to being the way they used to be as unique unique um individual hubs and the way the world is now i, I imagine a wilderness wasteland in between them of, of like god knows what mm. um and i think maybe that's an, an inevitable evolution of, of things however we get there after war and you know famine well, and everything the thing is, at the moment, it, for centralization to carry on as it is at the moment, given the collapse in fertility rates, this yeah. only the only way centralization can continue at the present per, uh, way. I mean, they they tried immigration to try and compensate for fertility problems and to keep centralization as it is at the moment, and that's clearly not going to work because the receive the country sending their populations are crashing as well. So unless they integrate like high technology, for example, cloning of some sort to replace people, which I'm gonna, f I think it's gonna be very hard for them to do. Then eventually mm. in the future we're gonna have some sort of crunch or crash where everybody's gonna have to devolve back into smaller communities anyway, because yeah. there's no way this can continue indefinitely. Yeah. Uh, that's but that's mm. something which, yeah, that's obviously a, a much bigger topic I guess for another time. Yeah, well, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we should, we can maybe set that up and discuss that some other time if you want. I'd love to talk about that. Um, but for now, I'm going to go. So thank you. And, no problem. Uh, thank you very much. And that's it. Right. Uh, so talk to you later. Yeah, see you. Bye-bye.